very much. Welcome to the most exciting, uh, exciting session about accessible gaming. Since I know next to nothing about gaming, I, I played uh, slot machines 20 years ago in Las Vegas. Uh, I've asked a real expert in, uh, in gaming to, to help me and, and support me. Uh, welcome, David Hofer. Thanks, uh, thanks for being with us. Um, you are the CEO of LifeTool, and uh, why don't you start with a brief introduction of yourself? Thank you, Wilfried. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here. And uh, first of all, um, congratulations to the sign language interpreters who are doing a fantastic job uh, live and uh, online. Um, because I mentioned that because I'm a son of a deaf parent, so I grew up uh, with um, little things that were helpful to my parents, technical things. Uh, I'm father of uh, two sons. The one is 10, the other is 19, so I have some relation to gaming, maybe your kids as well in the future. Uh, and as you've mentioned, uh, I am the CEO of LifeTool, uh, and as such, uh, I'm head of a fantastic team, totally devoted uh, about assistive technology um, and uh, where accessible gaming um, became an issue a couple of years ago. Wonderful, thank you. I would like also to welcome our remote guests, Marina and, and, uh, and Thomas, hi. Uh, and we know you have produced a wonderful video and why don't we start with, uh, with the video right away, okay? How did SpawnPoint even begin, or how did we get the idea that we would do something like that? It's not like we fall from the sky and think, yes, accessible gaming, let's do it. In the fall of last year, we organized a charity event. It was called Gamers 4, and in the course of the event, we had a program point where DIC, a paraplegic streamer who is very good friends with us, joined us in a challenge. Back then, we thought that it would be really nice to watch Philip Hansa and Kevin Petitjev from Ö3 and Radio Energy racing against IC. In the end, IC lapped them dozens of times and won by far. And we thought it's amazing that he, IC, can do that, even though he can't really move his fingers anymore. We were so fascinated by that, and it was also so beautiful. The moment when it just happened was an experience that was easy to look at, and there were so many positive emotions that we thought, let's just make an event for accessible gaming. Structural and other facilities, means of transport, technical objects of daily use, information processing systems, acoustic and visual information sources and communication facilities as well as other designed areas of life are barrier-free if they are generally customary for people with disabilities, without particular difficulty and generally without outside help can be found, accessed and used. The use of aids required due to disabilities is permitted. But I mean barrierefrei, which directly translates to barrier-free, just feels wrong when you use it. So accessible, what is really 100% accessible? Does that even exist? That's why I always find it so difficult when I hear that word anywhere, regardless of whether it's in games or at events or wherever, because I have also been asked now, are you a barrier-free event? In general, barrier-free is a difficult term. I would rather refer to low barrier or actually the English term of accessibility in the sense of accessible. Yes, I think accessibility is really a nice word. I think to myself that in the development of products, in the design of products, software products, and any kind of products, it is simply about making as much as possible accessible. Ideally, you have a game that anyone can use very easily without any problems. So now I don't know by heart, how do you make it accessible, a game more accessible for people with motor disabilities, more accessible to people with a visual impairment? Something like colorblindness is possible to implement, but 
There is a very good website, the Game Accessibility Guidelines, which really do give suggestions for the special impairments. So I think the example you just brought, Alex, with the color blindness is actually easy to understand. So as a game developer, of course, you have a clear goal. The more players you can involve, the better it is for your own success. It's a win-win situation and colorblindness it's almost 10%. I think 8 to 10% of men are colorblind and that's so simple. But if I'm not colorblind, then I don't think about the fact that every 10th person might be colorblind. Not even all of the people who are colorblind know that they are actually colorblind. Yeah. Especially since there are different types of colorblindness. But the interesting thing is that this is a topic that has already been taken up by games. What I would like to have now as a developer is, hey, we have plugins here for the common engines. If you put them in, they make your life easier by making them accessible for people with disabilities. In fact, it is unfortunately still the case, so at least I can say that for the German area, from the statistics, that people in all their abundance, be it psychological, learning impairment, visual impairment, whatever, are still relatively socially isolated. That means you actually come into contact with it less than you might like. And Thomas, you just got it right. You came across it by chance and initially there was a lack of knowledge and also of points of contact. And this knowledge and the touch comes and you notice that now at studios like Naughty Dog who with The Last of Us 2 have really set an accessibility standard that in my opinion is unmatched to date. They only did that because it might be a bit random and they bought knowledge. Because it's completely clear, well, I'm no expert either, but I am able now to classify blindness and visual impairment, but there are even more differences. And at the same time, it starts with the fact that one accessibility for one person is a barrier for the other. I'll give an example. Lowered curbs are very important for wheelchair users in traffic so that they can easily cross the street, but it's terrible for the blind with a white cane. It's an absolute barrier and danger, a risk. So that's where it starts, a barrier that is seen so differently and it takes knowledge and many institutions have simply hardly come to contact with it. And that is coming slowly now. And of course, digitalization also helps with its adaptivity, that you can insert options, but also, of course, with streaming. So that something like this is more and more visible in society, which of course contributes to this. And at the same time, of course, it's not that easy either. You just have to say that. I found it exciting to do some research for the event. Of course, uh, at the very beginning, we first had to deal with how big is the target group. When you do an event like Spawnpoint, of course, you have to look at who are you doing it for, who is the audience, and so on. And then I found it exciting to see how big the target group actually is when you somehow sum up all disabilities, all restrictions, and so on. It's mind-blowing to see how many differences there are and how many people are really affected in the end. There aren't many statistics uh, where you look at what percentage of the target group is interested in gaming at all. And that is actually an enormous number, where at the beginning I was not sure whether that could be true, because now I have, for example, GameAccessibility.com in front of me. They have made a report about the Accessibility Foundation in the Netherlands and they evaluated what percentage of the candidates are really gamers and it turns out that is 92% of all candidates from the target group. Of course, everything is included, yes, from one hour a week to 10.5 and so on. But the fact that people are in contact with it is excellent, because I do believe that games as such, and of course it now depends on how game developers deal with that, are a medium that makes it possible that you have more social contacts again. Yeah, 
Du musst nicht raus. You don't have to go out. You don't have to go anywhere. Especially with Icy, you can see it clearly. Of course, he has a hard time going anywhere. He belongs to a risk group and can't get out now. But of course, he has very good opportunities to build a social life again. Our main problem with things like this is of course always monetary. Because we have a certain budget for our products and we somehow get into a dilemma. Personally, I would also like to have people who otherwise have difficulty establishing social contacts have this opportunity to live this out here. In the end, it would probably have to be something where there is somehow some kind of funding or something for doing something like that. Because the publishers are not currently doing it, maybe one would have to force it more and more so that it would be a requirement. And for example, let's look at the consoles. It would be easy for the console developers, that is platform holders, to say that we have a new requirement for our consoles, that these minimum standards of accessibility must be included. You can also see it when you look, for example, at Xbox with the controller that they made. A cool piece of hardware that just got funding and was only started because there is a personal connection to that topic on their team. And that's it. <laughs> Doorknobs are the worst thing ever invented. Putting on shoes, the cell phones that I use, these are the sorts of things that we don't think about until we have to. And I think about them every day. Yeah! I have cerebral palsy on my entire right side. This side of the controller is fine. This side doesn't happen. As game platforms have gotten more sophisticated, the controllers have gotten more sophisticated, and it started to get really frustrating. Oh, no! oh. We designed the Xbox Adaptive Controller through feedback from the accessibility community. <laughs> the Xbox Adaptive Controller is really easy. You just plug it in, and then you can plug in various other devices. I can make it work for me the way it has to. With the Xbox Adaptive Controller, a gamer can game with one hand and one foot, or one hand and their shoulder, or even one foot and their chin. And I can change it from uh, game to game. Uh, as a small studio, it is obviously much more difficult, so it has to be there for indies. Yes and no. So, as I said, I always try to bring this into teaching myself, both in the computer science area for app development and software development, as well as in the game area, because there are small things, such as the controls themselves are adaptable, so that I can choose which buttons are assigned how, so that I can perhaps play the game more easily without being offended by the game. <laughs> well, that's just good game design in general, but okay. <laughs> or the color schemes or subtitles, these are tiny little things that are really not expensive to develop and I think that would be really good. That's why game accessibility guidelines have such a great checklist, that is an Excel checklist. In the basic version, almost all of it can be implemented very quickly. And most of all, I think it's paying off too. In the basic version, there are almost all of them really very quickly to do. When you think about the fact that we said color blindness, if that's 10% that you suddenly have, it pays off in monetary terms. What I have now addressed was more about subjects that go beyond that, because that's almost standard that you can assign keys, that you have subtitles and so on. That's standard almost everywhere, because it is also in the requirement. You will laugh, you say so, but in reality it's not. We recently tested software for team collaboration evaluation and jumping was automatically set to X and you couldn't remap it. It drove me crazy, I can't tell you enough. I sat there as a hacker gamer, actually at the end of the day, I can't do anything with jumping with the key X. As hardcore gamer, eigentlich am end of the day, I can't with jumping on X nothing start. And of course, I gave them feedback right away and it was written in bold, please implement remapping keys. Implement remapping keys. Schriftgröße. Font size. I mean, I imagine I'm slowly getting into an age where I slowly have to read more carefully. Stand in line. <laughs> but that's okay. Yes, it would be so simple to implement and that's a shame because you lose out on it too.
Aber dann wieder, also I've also spoken to Toby uh, because they also have a slot at the event. Just to explain Toby to the audience. Toby is, they build hardware, so basically a normal computer that you can control with your eyes. So they have sensors inside that look where you are looking and then the mouse moves and you can control it. It's really cool. I've already tried it out myself. I was amazed at how well it works. Not perfect, but good. And I also chatted with them. They would like to have so much more contact with the game developers and uh, they incorporate it more and use it really well. So I said to him, well, you have to look at their point of view. At the end of the day, it is always a budget question, whether it makes sense for the expansion of the target group. It doesn't have the benevolent value, so to speak, that you say, yes, you are a cool company that looks out for everyone. And then he said, yes, but it's so easy anyway. We've made an API and then you just have to implement it. No, it's more than that. Well then, let's call it a day. So I had fun. I hope you guys too. I hope the audience enjoyed it. I think it's an exciting topic and there's more to it. So all the latest at the Spawn Point event in February, February 12th and 13th. Mark it in your calendar with thick red marker. Uh, I would be happy if you all come and watch and I would be happy if you share it in all directions. Wow, that was really, really, really impressive. Thank you so much. Um, Marina and Thomas, please come in and, uh, and say hello and tell us a little bit more about your organization, please. Hi. Hello, guys. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, um, if you look at Whoop, we basically have to look back uh, two years in time because that's where it started. Um, we started off as a small gaming stream, I would say. Yeah. It was more like a, like a hobby we just wanted to have fun. Have fun, show our gaming in the internet, and maybe build up a little bit of a community. Uh, but over time, uh, it changed. We got more and more people. Uh, we got more and more into event management, into consulting. Everything got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's basically our way towards spawn point. Yeah? And step after step after step, we had small events, bigger ones, bigger ones. And now we we do something that, uh, that really that we really enjoy, basically, because that's what we do. We we try to combine things that, well, of course, we have to earn money in some way. That's one yeah. point. <laughs> Second point is things uh, we love, which is gaming. gaming. <laughs> and the best way of the project we can have uh, is if we also have the third point, which, which is some kind of social component. Um, and I think accessible gaming is, is perfect for that. <laughs> Wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about the gaming community itself? Uh, well, the gaming community is actually more diverse than one would guess because it's like most everybody's playing games at some point. Maybe on a smartphone when you're traveling to work or just on a computer. 10 minutes a day, 10 hours a day, it doesn't matter. It's not like you have those stereotypical um, images in your head of a gamer. Could be any person you see around. In fact, it's it's a lot of persons you wouldn't expect from them that are playing games. So it's a huge community. It's a very diverse community, and it's just a lot of, actually, almost a lot of love and support. And I really like the community. And you feel you feel like you can arrive there and you have a place there, no matter where you come from, who you are, what drives you there, or something else. So it's just a great community, I'd say. Mm. Yeah. It's nothing like the stereotype we had uh, in earlier years, I think. No, no, it's it's not it's not like you sit in front of a computer. It's not a, it's not a the skinny, it's it's a skinny, a, white, the skinny guy. white guy it's, with it's, the glasses and a nerdy look yeah. or something. Yeah. It's got such a diverse community. Like, just look at uh, movie stars, for example. You have uh, Henry Cavill, you have uh, The Rock and... and all those guys are playing games. Win Diesel, yeah. All those yeah, guys, yeah. Are, guys are playing games regularly, and uh, it's getting more and more common to uh, communicate communicate that to the outside world and to maybe even use it as as uh, a good marketing thing for yourself. Yeah, as a to tool to connect with others and just 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Advertise yourself a little bit. So hey, I'm playing games. What about you? And also, and also the the whole uh, world of accessible gaming. If you look at that, it's it's just yes. it's one more part. But but uh, if you play with someone on the internet, it's it's not like you you know every single person you're playing with, right? No, and you just know their gameplay and who they are in your game, but you don't know who is sitting in front of the screen. And it doesn't matter. Yeah, so that provides a lot yeah. of opportunities for yeah. everyone. Wonderful. David, what's your relation to, to gaming? <laughs> well, um, somehow, uh, Willy, you and I, we are a little bit like, like uh, Stadler and Waldorf. You remember these guys from uh, Muppet Show uh, um, when we grew up. However, I don't know so much about uh, gaming, uh, but I learned from my oldest friend um, 20 years, 30 years ago when he uh, had his um, you know, two bars and one ball game. Uh, you remember that? Uh, we, uh, he, he introduced that, uh, introduced that to me. Um, and we still, after 30 years, meet um, every second uh, month um, playing Wii, Wii or golf on Wii uh, the whole evenings. This is uh, what we love to do every second month. But there's another connection, my parents. I mentioned my parents who are deaf. Uh, when my father retired from uh, work, uh, when the cat died, um, he started um, to invent gaming for him and my mother. So my mother is 81 now, my father is uh, a little bit younger, um, and they do gaming together. So this is another thing that I was surprised of, because uh, they you know, were like, don't play too much, and now they play by themselves a lot, uh, because we have moved out. And um, me and my brothers and, and my, my sister at that time. And uh, in my profession, when I, at LifeTool, we have developed a computer mouse that is solely controlled with your lips. And it was um, a tool that replaced your hands, if, or if you're not were able to you know, use a computer with your hands, you could use it with your lips. And uh, when we developed the second generation of it, we got feedback from the, from the community asking us to uh, um, implement something that allows them to play computer games uh, um, and Flash-based games. Even Flash is now history. Um, we have uh, introduced, you know, uh, a joystick uh, and a, a keyboard function so they can um, access and play computer games uh, just with their lips. And uh, this was my ticket, my, my entry ticket to this whole accessible uh, gaming uh, community. Very good, thank you. You have a couple of more questions, I think, to, to I Thomas do, and Marina. I do, I okay. do. Uh, Thomas and Marina, it's a great to see you here. Um, and I remember our first meeting, uh, and uh, it's just amazing, you know, to uh, share um, our passion for accessible gaming with the world. Uh, and I remember, and you remember, I guess, uh, one question I, I had at the end of our first meeting at LifeTool, when I asked you, you know, it's uh, embarrassing a little bit, but I, I, I need to know what is span point actually, what does it mean actually? So it was, um, it is a question I would like to ask you again for the whole community. What does span point mean? It's funny that you're asking. Um, <laughs> when we came up with the idea of span point, um, of course everything starts with a logo and a name, right? Uh, the idea, the logo and the name. And uh, we were looking so hard for, for names that uh, try to pick up some of the gaming spirit, right? So we, we looked up all the, and we made a brainstorming of all the words that we, we could games. think of yeah. using games, basically. And then we tried to put them together in some creative way. Um, yeah, to create something catchy. It, it was not that easy, to be honest. No. We had a lot of things that wouldn't be appropriate in that context, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> but uh, we came up with spawn point, which is a technical term when it comes to computer games. Um, just to explain it shortly, uh, if you play a game, like for example, a shooter, yeah, those bad, bad killing games, everybody knows it. <laughs> um, you basically, if you, if you die, uh, you respawn immediately. So you come back to life, but um, not anywhere on the map. You come back in your, in your base, basically. Uh, and that's called a spawn point. So it's it's a location where you come back to life in a game. It's a starting point for everyone in the game, and it's where you you cannot die. You just just start again, and that's just the connection between 
uh, gaming and real life spawn point. It's like no matter where you come from, you're all the same once you enter the game because you're all on the same spawn point. Yeah, and that's also how we came up with the slogan of the, of the event. One different game equals, so it doesn't matter where you come from, basically. Yeah. Uh, if you have the proper tools, uh, people will accept you. Like every single other person. So that's why we came up with that name. I think it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant idea. And uh, um, you mentioned that in your video, but I would like to ask you again, um, why accessible gaming? How how was your um, how how was 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 your span, span point uh, uh, in terms of accessible gaming? What was the what was the moment uh, where you decided, or what was the the uh, event where you decided uh, we are going for that? Uh, there was the charity event we did last summer or late summer. Um, it was for the gamers four. And we had, as already mentioned in the video, IC, which uh, is a disabled streamer. And um, we had a lot of fun. And Philip Hansa and Kevin also had a lot of fun playing with him. And then we were like, OK, this is one thing that's not looked at um, the way it should be. It's not a very common topic to talk about or to make some events about. And we thought, like, OK, we know, we know IC. He knows a lot of gamers. We know some gamers that are disabled to one point, so why not help them to connect with each other, to connect with um, developers, software, hardware, doesn't matter, to just help this topic to gain some more like visibility. Visibility, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there are a lot of gamers out there that um, struggle to play video games because of their disabilities, and it doesn't have to be like that because there are so many things out there that help you access games no matter what your disability is. We actually also had, um, it was a young mother, um, <clears throat> she had a boy. Yeah. Uh, she actually texted us in the Twitch during one of the streams, which was funny too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Max mentioned it. Uh, he's a, a colleague of us. Um, and she was asking um, what she can do. Uh, if, because her son is uh, playing uh, Call of Duty, which is a shooter game, but he's playing it on an Xbox controller with his feet, which is obviously not it, meant it's just, to be you, played. You with cannot think feet. about no, yeah, no. But this Xbox controller got broken. Yeah, yeah, it broke down, and um, she was asking if there are any substitutes to that, anything that will work better for her son, of course. And then we pointed out that there is, of course, the, the Xbox adaptive controller, and she had the first reaction she had was. I can never afford something like that. It's, yeah. it's too expensive. I'm a yeah. young mother and and all that kind of stuff. And and she uh, and we told her, well, it's just one hundred dollars in the base version, right? Uh, and, and she was like, she was blown away basically. But she had no idea that it could be that cheap for that kind of disability. That of course, cheap and that easy, yeah. of course, there are also more expensive yeah. uh, options. But um, but people just don't know. They don't know, yeah. And, and that's why we want to bring up the topic to everyone. Yes, and that in connection with with the spawn point event with IC, right? It's the trigger for us to go to accessible gaming. Yeah. I think this is um, exactly um, why I, I, I really appreciate that we started a collaboration and we're working together uh, and together with Zero to um, spread the word uh, that there are solutions out there. There are, um, like you've mentioned, the adaptive controller. Um, there are many, so it's all about raising awareness um, that gaming um, can be fully accessible if you just know about it. And uh, I'm, I'm totally happy to have you raising uh, or spreading the word about it. Um, my last question would be um, the, about the future. So what are your plans for the future? Uh, I know that there is something big going on on Friday and Saturday, so in two days and three days. Uh, but uh, what's next? What's after that? You are young. We are going to retire soon, but you are, you know, what, what, is, what, what are the plans? <laughs> <laughs> Funny that you mentioned that we are younger. It feels like I got older at least two years in the last two months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at but, least in the last week. <laughs> but of course, first of all, we want to we wanna make a good impression with Spawn Point. And so far, we got great feedback from all our partners, from uh, the community, from... All the speakers we have invited to be guests. Yes, yes. And everybody gave us back uh, feedback like, it's, it's such a great thing what we are doing, uh, which, of course, motivates us to keep on, yeah. Yeah, to keep going. 
Um, I mean, we have to look at, at how COVID will turn out in the future, but our plans, of course, are to repeat that as a series. We're not completely sure, but we are thinking about um, two times a year, like one time in the summertime, um, which is like an expo with uh, all, all the relevant parts of an expo. Uh, with, with companies showing showing off their equipment, their tools, they, uh, yeah. with speakers on a local panel, and so on and so forth. And the second one is like this one plant we are planning right now, which is almost, almost completely online. online yeah. um, and but I mean, of course, we have to to figure out a way to do that during the COVID times. And, and it's not going to go away soon, I guess. So we will see. Yeah. But uh, we are looking forward for the future for future events. Because we definitely think it's a it's a topic that has to get more awareness, has to get more uh, attention of, of the people out there, and it's extremely um, important that we build some kind of link between all of those people out there that just need to be connected to everybody else. Yeah, and besides Spawn Point, it's just that uh, Whoop is gonna be doing some more events. Maybe yeah, smaller yeah. ones. Yeah, it's not just spawn point. We also yeah. do events that um, combine uh, the topics music and gaming a lot, and that's planned for the future also. Uh, and a lot of consulting and so on and so forth, but nothing. Yeah, just so what far. we love to do. Yeah, gaming, streaming. Yeah. Like we said, those three components. If, yeah. if that's if we hit those three, that's perfect that's for us. Just fine, yeah. <laughs> we just go with it. Okay, very good. I have two two more questions. One is, um, you mentioned that the, the gaming usually is happening quite anonymously. Uh, so how do you socialize then in the in the gaming environment? It depends. Um, you there are a lot of platforms you can use uh, like Discord. Uh, Twitter is also very gamey uh, nowadays as a social media platform. Uh, and within the game, it depends on the game. Uh, so you have there can be everything from no interaction at all some games uh, or not even playing with another one up to mmos where you do voice chat you do, do text chat you you actually plan meetings for your clan or your guild or whatever it is it really depends on the on the genre of games and on on the game itself uh, if we look at uh, games that are widespread out there like especially esports games like league of legends and uh, maybe counter-strike or call yeah, of duty Rocket or something League, like that you almost always have uh, some kind of voice communication within the team. Because you need to coordinate all your teammates and make sure everyone is doing what the team leader wants them to do in order to reach the goal of yeah. the game. Yeah. yeah, And it depends on a little bit on the community, on, on how, to be honest, it depends on the community, on how well people are received or uh, how yeah. uh, well yeah. they behave uh, and on the game. But most of the times, it, it doesn't really matter where you're from or, or what you are like, if you have any disabilities, as long as you do what you're supposed to do and you're, uh, you're friendly and, uh, and you fit into the team, as long as that happens, everybody is, is happy. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned these accessibility game uh, guidelines uh, for, the, for the gaming industry. Uh, is this like a, a thing you would like to promote or is it a, a work in progress? Is there additions possible due to new developments or things like this? Well, those accessibility guidelines, um, they are not presented by us. We just... Um, um, Johanna, it's just a source. Yeah, Johanna, found, Johanna yeah. Pirker told us about it because she's uh, teaching computer sciences at the Technical University in Graz. Um, but um, they are developing over time, over and over, and there are several steps within those guidelines. So you have one simple kind of implementation of accessibility. I think it's four steps. I'm not completely sure up to complete whatever that is, complete accessibility. I'm not even sure that's going to be possible. I'm, but, I'm not, yeah. But I don't think um, they are going to be developed in the future. It's, it's an ongoing process as far as, as I know. Okay, very good. So maybe you in the in the chat you can share uh, some of the links, and we can we can promote it that the the audience who wants to follow that they have a point uh, a point of reference. My last question yeah. to you to you would be thank you. Uh, since we uh, we at Zero Project we just had a crash course in moving uh, a, a real conference into a virtual one. Uh, how are you doing it? And uh, because I, I know I think it starts on Friday. Uh, so what's uh, give us a, a little bit more details what's uh, what's going to happen how you're going to stream uh, how long it's going to last and who's going to participate Ooh, a lot of question marks there <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, how long is it going to last? That's an easy one. Uh, we are going to start on Friday at uh, 12. 12 um, Vienna time. A.M. A.M., yeah. Yeah. yeah um, okay. Central European time. Yeah, very good. So wherever you are, you have to calculate the time zone. Um, and then we will go on until 10 p.m. that day and the same on Saturday. And then the event is over. Um, what's going to happen is it's a very good question. It's a wide variety of things. We we have planned some kind of storytelling elements. Yes, we, we invited some uh, streamers and um, disabled gamer, podcaster, whatever, who are going to speak about their experience with accessibility in gaming, uh, German ones, international ones. We have some panel discussion with researchers, with um, going to talk about the future of accessibility in gaming or all the aspects of disabilities like uh, visual impairment. Uh, yeah, we have some specials as well. Yeah, we have specials. Um, one more point. Uh, we also look into in exciting projects like Live2. Yeah, so, that's, that's so right. Yeah, we have some close up on on projects and, and tools like from Live2 and Xbox Adaptive Controller. We have Toby, all of them showing what they have. Yeah, what they are working on basically yeah. right now, uh, and then we have uh, some specials to lighten up the mood because it's it's one thing we don't want to um, to make spawn or to we want to make it a yeah fun we want event. to make it exciting and yeah. fun and entertaining yeah. as well. I mean, of course, there are panel discussions. They are usually a little bit dry. That's but important. But, but important, of yeah, course. Yeah. Um, but we also want to keep some kind of entertainment factor, which is why there also will be uh, live music and why there also will be, for example, we invited uh, eight of uh, eight singers eight, yeah, and songwriters. Musicians, musicians from Austria. From Austria, from very <laughs> well-known bands in Austria, at least. Um, they will play FIFA against each other whilst... Uh, um, having, having some, some challenges. Yeah, they have I'm some saying. challenges. Yeah, we, we're not <clears throat> gonna say a much, a lot about it because you have to watch it. <laughs> Basically, what we will try with them is to to simulate some kind of disability, yeah. so that they jump into their feed for once and see how oh, it not goes that for them. Yeah. And we also have esports teams on Saturday, which is very interesting because they they will struggle with with visual impairment glasses we we got from which Dialog is, im Dunkeln, yeah. which is a, a Viennese uh, museum like. Um, organization where they try to visualize for you <laughs> what what yeah yeah you means. you just go through uh, all the rooms in completely darkness like you would be blind yes. that's just the point of it yeah. so yeah yeah I think that's will it will be very exciting I'm I'm very much looking forward to it so. Very good. Good luck for it. And uh, I just want to, uh, we just have a question from the from the chat. Uh, I'm quoting uh, regarding the Gamergate mass riots of 2014 and beyond. What is your take on uh, exclusionary, hateful, and behavior towards persons with disabilities in the gaming community? <clears throat> well, like I said, um, I think um, hatefulness or, or yeah. It's, it's just like in real life, you do have some people who always want to be like, not very nice. Yeah, and there are communities in a, there are a couple of games where communities are known to not be that friendly as yeah. others. But uh, and they those are mostly very competitive uh, games. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, what is our take on it? That's you just it's have to, to try to stand yeah. on top of it and try to support those people. When you see it in chat, you have to stand up for it. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, and, some some games have. Uh, the option to report those players. Yes. So to make sure they're not harming anyone else. Especially the big games, like yeah. we told before, League of Legends and so on. They all have reporting features to report hateful speech, uh, and they simply get banned. And they, well, I mean, they lose the money they invested in the game and all of those precious items of theirs they acquired over too the bad, time. Too bad. Too bad. So that's something you can regulate up to some point. Of course. But you cannot avoid it. Completely. No, you cannot avoid. But it's like going out on the street. They always yeah, yeah, be, sure, sure. They always like be hateful life. people, but you have to to try to fight it at some point. I mean, yeah, if you really want it to stop, you just have to say something. It's like in real life. If you watch it and you don't say a word, you're gonna be like you're contributing to it. Yes, yes. To some point, 
And if you stand up and say something and um, say, do not cross that line, it's going to be helpful because if more people would do that, a lot of those hateful gamers would go back, I'd say, or not even not, not want to be like that anymore because there are a lot of people out there blaming them for their behavior. Yeah, but in general, um, I mean, if they have a hard time <laughs> finding out that you are in some kind of way have a disability right yeah because yeah. they, they don't, don't see you they just hear you at in the in the yeah best yeah place. and and for most games you just have like your gaming avatar and you decide what that looks like what you want people to tell um what do you want to tell them about you so you don't have to say who you are and yeah, yeah. Okay, thank also, you being, um, yeah, it's also communities uh, and games out there that are more friendly than others. So yeah, keep course. that in mind. Uh, if you want to play an competitive game, of course, there will be people who try hard all the time and they get very um, aggressive. Yeah, aggressive <laughs> if, if yeah. you don't pull your weight, so to speak. But that can be avoided. Okay, thank you. We have two more questions from the from the chat. Um, uh, mine is, uh, what impact will uh, artificial intelligence have on keeping gamers with disabilities to take over some operations? Uh, oh, sorry. Could you just uh, repeat so the, that the one? Impact, the impact of uh, artificial intelligence into the into gaming, also in regards to person with disabilities. Would would you think uh, this gets uh, becomes? An, a, a more exclusive factor, or would you would you think it it enhances inclusion? I'd say it enhances inclusion because it's um, yeah, it's more hardware technical stuff that could help people with disabilities, of course. Um, especially if we if you look at those products, uh, like for example, Toby is providing, right? Mm -hmm. um, those kind of things would benefit enormously from AI. Yes. Because um, just to give you an example, why I, I said, for example, that uh, <laughs> I tried out Toby, it's good, but it's not perfect. Um, basically, I got to that conclusion because when you play some kind of game and it's it has some kind of, I, I don't want to don't want to say um, jump uh, scares or something like that, but you will react to stuff if you play fast paced games, right? And then you can't avoid looking in some direction, and then you will automatically rotate there. Um, I think an, some kind of AI would support those kind of products and features a lot. Yeah, so it will be helpful <laughs> for people with disabilities using AI products. Thank you. David? Um, I got some question. Uh, do people have to register for Spawn Point, uh, or is it open to anyone and everyone? Uh, it's open for everybody. Uh, you can just join on on Twitch, uh, yeah. for example, twitch.tv uh, slash VOOCTV underline official. Uh, and when we're live, we're live and you can join whenever you want. And, and you just open Twitch. You just open yeah. Twitch and, and you can going. chat with us as well. So if you have some questions or want to say something, go ahead, put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and the last question, how does Spawn Point itself support disabled gamers and how do you plan uh, to be allies in this in this respect? Um, so how do we support <laughs> okay. how do we support uh, disabled gamers? Well, our our point uh, of Spawn Point is that we want to um, build up communication. We want to connect people. Yeah. We want to. We want um, to build a network. If we, in some points. If we look at that one mother, for example, that connect, that's uh, texted us on Twitch in our stream. Yeah. We want to inform people about what's out there, and therefore we have to get as much visibility as possible, uh, which is why also which is why we implement um, 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 segments like the one with the musicians and stuff like that, because we usually get more visibility if you put in stuff like that. So, and if you have people who spread the word yeah. and have uh, some kind of their own community. Because it is like, uh, if we look back at the video we, we had before, it is like um, my colleague said, um, there's no awareness. If you get in contact with it, you, you will get interested into what is it about. And then everything else. But before that, yeah, before that, easy. you're just not having it on, like, in your head. You don't think about it if it's not 
problem or an issue you have to deal with. So, yeah. All right, David. Um, well, I, I, I you know, um, mentioned um, our age at the beginning of our discussion. I'm very impressed uh, uh, what you do um, at uh, Spawn Point. Nevertheless, as I've mentioned uh, your age, I know that you had birthday yesterday. So from Life Tool and the whole community, zero, a little alles Gute, thank, thank you, you for your birthday. And um, good luck for Spawn Point. Thank you so much, David. That's very kind of you. Of course. Um, you <laughs> uh, thank you, Thomas. I think this has been most, most interesting because this is definitely uh, an issue and a topic we have never covered in, in, in Zero Project. I think it in, really in, enhances our, our reach and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really curious what's going to happen uh, in the chat. Good luck for your event on uh, this weekend and please do keep in touch and, and David, thank you so much for coming. Of uh, it's always a pleasure to have you, and uh, thank you, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.